But I am going to be telling you, you've got to go to grow. You've got to move out and move up and move on. It's about moving forward to, and you see Gethsemane? Very few people has been to Gethsemane. Very few. And if they've been there, like the apostles, they sit around it while Jesus is going through the experience, they are sleeping. And so every experience here a Christian must have, and as we journey to reach the world, the process is part of the deal. So I am introducing to you the pathway to power from the manger to the upper room and furthermore. So please come. Uh, my sermons will not be long. Um, so they are, because I have to introduce this, it's a, a little few minutes extra. But let's go to today's sermon. It's two Christmas so-called texts, but I'm going to be preaching in season and out of season. And uh, so the first text will be taken from Luke chapter 2. And my topic for today is move out from the manger and go to the house, the house where Jesus is. And the text for today is Luke 2, 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for them in the end. My emphasis is the manger, not the Christmas scene. And in Matthew, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11, we see then the, and when they were come into the house, they moved from the scene, the picture moves from the manger two years later to the house. Jesus was not in the manger. He didn't remain in the manger. He moved to the house. And so we have to move from the manger. Get out of the manger. I will be showing you the dangers of the manger. When you stay there too long. Oh my goodness. And as a pastor, I've seen this so many times. So many places. Manger. Manger people. They have been so long in the manger that they have become managers of the manger. And so we want to get out of the manger. We have to go there, uh, but then from there to the house. Move up, move up, move out, and move on. As that was there, you will find a parallel in the Old Testament that when the when Israel left Egypt, they moved camp 39 times and then got stuck at Kadesh Barnea, the border of the promised land. And so they kept on moving as good as the palm trees and the 12 springs and the 72 palm trees. They wanted to stay there. Oh, it was the best part of their journey. But they had to move on. There are times when you may be enjoying your life. Go ahead and enjoy it. But you can't stay there. If you want to grow, you've got to go. If you want to move on, you've got to move out. And so I want you to identify throughout this month where you are in your journey. And if, if you don't move out and move on, you will be dwarfed. So today is from move out from the manger and get into the house. Because as the scripture says, in the house, Jesus was there. And wherever Jesus is, there is the place I want to be. Are you going to help me preach today or I'm going to have to bring Jason up here? Bring him, bring him. I know the old man is. Uh... So let's go with um, Luke 2 7. 
They brought forth, she brought forth a firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. We're not touching that. Laid him in a manger because there was no room. Okay, so my emphasis is the manger. And the danger that's in the manger. Let's be positive. Jesus was born in a manger because there was no room for him outside. And so Jesus came in the world so that we who are in the world may move out of the world and come to the manger for an experience. What is this manger experience? It is more than Christmas. It is the story of the incarnation. When God became flesh and dwelt among us. The incarnation is God taking on flesh. And why we must go to the manger is because there flesh will put on God. There we will begin to become like Jesus Christ. It's our beginning. It's the journey begins at the manger. And so we must all go to the manger. It's a place of beginnings. It's a place where you start. It's the place where you are born again and become new. And so you can't be born again anywhere else in your spiritual journey but at the starting place at the manger which represents the new birth. No birth, no growth. You have to be born again. Verily I say unto you, except a man be born again. He cannot perceive, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then secondly, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So the manger experience is mandatory. It's the first step. You must come to the manger and receive the new birth, the born again experience. It's the place of beginnings, not the place of dwelling. Because like I said, if you stay too long in the manger, there is some danger. Why should we not stay in the manger? I think 1 Corinthians gives us an answer. When people stay too long in the manger, they grow in the manger. But what happens is they become big babies. And so, some churches have to have spiritual nurseries. And some pastors have to become babysitters. Why? Because these big babies... They cry, they sulk, they complain, and pout when they don't have their way. I read. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal. Even as unto babes in Christ. This is the mighty Corinthian church with all the gifts exploding. And all the dynamics of the Holy Spirit in the church. Yet he said, I want to speak to you some real heavy stuff. But I can't. Because you are still babes. I have fed you with milk and not meat. Because you were not able to bear it. Neither are you able now. They didn't grow. They remained babies. And I, we had a, one baby. We learned a few things. But since we had those two grandchildren, Lord, have we learned some things about babies. They will pick on each other and fight. Not, not physical, but fight for the toy. This one is playing with the toy for hours. As soon as the next one comes, he snatches the toy. This one begins to cry, ah, I want my toy. 
They will scramble over the toys. But you know what's nice about babies? Two minutes after they're hugging each other and they're kissing up each other and they're telling each other, I love you, baby sister. And she will say, I love you, baby brother. You see, now that is being childlike. But there's a difference between childlikeness and childishness. Without drawing any reference to this church and anybody, there are times I've seen childishness. Getting upset over very little things. I had, and I told you this before, one lady left the church because she was not greeted properly when she left the building. That is childishness. When people get offended over little things and they sulk, that is childishness. Paul says, when I was a child, I thought like a child. It's reasonable to think like a child when you are a child. We don't expect children to behave like adults. But he said, when I grew up and I became a man, I began to think like a man and I put away childish things. I think the time has come. We have to put away childish things. Come out of the manger. There is danger if you stay there too long. It's time to move out and move on. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to the next passage. Matthew 2, 11. And it's only going to get better. This is just teasing you. But soon I'll be pleasing you. <laughs> Matthew 2, 11. There's only one word I want to emphasize there. And I want it to dawn on you. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary the mother. Okay, the first thing. I want to be in any house where Jesus is. I remember we had church in hotel lobbies. Jesus was there. Remember when we uh, in Winter Garden when we started, and one day we got put out without notice from the hotel. They said, we, we, we have somebody else using the room. So with the 25 people I had, we went under a tree. And Jesus was there. Why? Where two or three are gathered together in my name. I am in the midst. I want to be where Jesus is. And that's a mark of the wise men. The wise men came to the house. So we moved from the manger to the house. And I want to be in the house where Jesus is. Where Jesus is Lord and where Jesus is worship. As they bow down and worship him. I want to be among those people. Those are the wise. We have two kinds of virgins in the church. The wise virgins and the foolish virgins. And you have to decide which one of the virgins you're going to be. Because the wise will worship. The wise will come to the house. And here is a problem since COVID. People have refrained from coming to the house of God. I pray that be destroyed. And that mentality be ruined. And a love for the house of God be returned. <laughs> Hallelujah. And in the process of staying away, I'm not going to compromise. In the process of staying away, some people have gotten cold. And they're backslidden. And they think they're all right. Go back to Revelation 3 and you see the accusation of Jesus Christ for this age. Amen. You have grown cold. That's good. He said so. I rather you were cold or hot. But when you see you mix it and it becomes lukewarm and you're neither hot nor cold, he said you're in danger. You're in trouble. If you were cold, I could warm you up. If you were hot, I can use you and spur you on. But when you're neither here nor there and you're feeling comfortable, you better get out of that zone. Can I hear somebody? Amen. We can best grow 
when we move into the house where Christ is. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. How can you know him if you stay far away from him? I always say, I love Mr. Obama. I just almost met him not too long ago. And I wanted to meet him because he's a good communicator, a great guy. Personally, in his persona. I, I know about him, but I don't know him. I feel if I sit down with him, and I'm going to get the chance, I'll sit down with him and chat a little bit, I will get to know him a little better. And so I think, the closer we get to Jesus, the more familiar we get with his presence and his word abiding in, in us, we can get to know him better. Amen. And when I take you down to the resurrection, you will hear what Paul says. Oh, that I might know him in the power. Know him. Know him, not his resurrection. That I might know him in the power of his resurrection. In the fellowship of his suffering. Ooh, nobody wants to get there. No, no, no. Just give me power. No, it don't work like that. Ask the butterfly. It doesn't work like that. That I might know him. I want to know him, Paul says. Paul said that. Yes, yes. How much more should we want to know him? Yes. Not just about him, but know him yes. in the power of his resurrection. Yes. Know him in the fellowship of his suffering. Yes. Walk with him in that fellowship. Fellowship with him in the suffering. Yes. Having been conformed to the death. I want to know him in his resurrection. I want to know him in his suffering. I want to know him in his death and his dying. Amen. That's how we can grow when we know who he is. Hallelujah. Wise men. And this is something I really want you to get. Nothing else I say, stay with you. I want you to see what's happening because people are not seeing this truth. They took out of the gifts opened their treasures and presented him gifts. They gave him gold. I won't touch the others. Let's talk about gold. Now, any pastor would be delighted when the people prosper. Because that's a joy to him. That's a burden he doesn't have to carry when people are struggling and can't pay their bills and don't know what to go, what to do, who to ask. So it's, it's, it's my joy when I see our people, as the verse said, my God shall supply all your needs. I, I, I want to see that happen. I want you to be successful. God wants you to be wealthy enough to have and to spare. You may not be super rich, but you have enough. And that alone is a blessing. Amen. You know, I don't have much, but I count my blessings, you know. I have enough every single day. I wake up, I have my, my wife makes me a cup of oats. I eat oats. Oh, I'm thankful I have oats. Yes. I eat a banana afterwards. Then she will have some kind of soup or something eh, 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 before lunch. I have that. I have my little herbs and my vitamins. I have not gone one day without food yet. Amen. I have not gone one day without shelter yet. Amen. I have not gone one day without the basics of life. Because God meets my need every day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise him and he meets yours too. The problem comes is when we want him to meet today next month needs. And because we don't see next month need today, we get worried. And we start to be, start to panic. Oh God, our Lord, uh, next month is coming. Yeah, he knows that. <laughs> but check your past. See which month God failed you. Go back and look. And see that the goodness 
this, you see, I put up this post. The bad things of life blinds us from seeing the goodness of God. You have a few bad days and you take that on, but you forget how many good days you had. You forget the goodness of God last year and the years before. And now you're going through a little bit of suffering and you want to throw your hands up in the air and say, Ah, oh God, where are you? Ah, oh God, you're not good enough. Ah, oh God, you're not good to me anymore. No, no, no. You're going through a faith. Move out and move in. The house of the Lord. Give him praise. Hallelujah. And so now this is where it might bother some people. I'll take my chance. Do you know that there's some Christians, not necessarily here, but I know a lot of Christians who have a lot of money in the bank. They got gold. Their future is secure. And I love that. That's awesome. How many of you believe that Jesus could come today? Amen. How many of you believe he could come next week? Amen. Or even this year? Come tell, I want an answer to this. How many of you believe that Jesus could come anytime? Okay, this is where I, where I want to nail it. If Jesus were to come anytime soon, now or this year, all the money you have in the bank will go to the Antichrist. That's what I want you to know. So pastor, you want me to take out all my money and give it? No. They took out of the treasures and gave him some gold. Nobody's asking you to take everything out and don't do like me. I've done that. Lay up treasures in heaven where rust and mud don't corrupt. Now I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to put myself out on a limb here. I I know you know your bank account and how nice it is here. What's the condition of your bank account in heaven? Amen. When, when, when Jesus said, give account of your stewardship. When he asks you to give account of what you have done with what he gave you, what are you going to say? You see, all, some give all. And all give some. But give. Give. Take a little bit of gold. And give now. Because I don't know what you have in your will. And most people don't will anything to the church anymore. That's their business. I am talking about you and your heavenly bank account. I'm talking about when you have to give account to God. Oh Lord, I, I, every TV evangelist I give something. Bad business. I am telling you now, there are fellas out there who don't deserve a penny of your money. Because when you need prayer, go call them. Right here, as a pastor to another pastor, I wanted to chat with this pastor, nice guy. He gave me an appointment three months later. I'm telling you the truth. So I, 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 I called it. Separate. Say, what? He knows me. I know him. Yeah, but his schedule would not allow it. You can see him for 20 minutes, three months from now. And I know the man very well. Sad to say. Before the three months and my appointment was due, he was caught in the biggest scandal and had to give up the church. They fired him. You see, he had time for slackness. <laughs> because they set a camera in his office. And they found him and his secretary um, fellowshipping. <laughs> know that we will all give account. I'm telling you, we will all give account from up to down, low and in between. So, it's going to be on your shoulder what you do with what God has given to you. Take out from your treasure and give a gift. 
And here's why. I'm done. Mary and Joseph needed that money. When they gave him the gold, the same night, an angel said to them, flee into Egypt. You know how much, how many miles that would be? It would take them three to four days non-stop travel from where they were to wherever in Egypt they were going. Jesus and Mary and Joseph needed that money for transportation. They needed it for food and shelter where they were going. I don't recall they had any relatives in Egypt. So when you give, you are ministering to the Lord himself. How they spend it, that's their business. They gave him the goal, but they paid rent. They paid transportation. They had to buy food. So when you give to the Lord, and this church is very, very um, accountable. Whether you understand it or not, every single month, sometime we may, because the CPA can't come, we may push it off for the next month a couple of times. But every penny is accounted for. We have bank account, we have P&L, we have cash flow, we have a balance sheet. The council sees it every month. We, we discuss it, we cut ways, we trim ways. We have cut down nearly 50% of our spending because of the situation. So, be a wise person. Come to the house, go to the house, wherever you want to go, that's fine. I, you know, I, I done with this thing about where church people go to. Done with that. You want to go somewhere? God bless you, go. If you have the courtesy and the manners to tell me you're going, that's fine. But if you don't, I will understand. Because babes behave like that. Sometimes we're looking for the kid in the house. In the house. We start a panic. Where is this kid? She's three years old. Because my wife, last brother, how old was he? Five years old. Went playing hide and seek. And they couldn't find him for the rest of the day. They couldn't find him for the night. The next day somebody went to the back of the house and they had this old gibbon fridge. And when they opened the door, the child was dead, dead in the fridge. She lost her last brother. Because they couldn't find the kid. And he had trapped himself. And so when you go in hiding. And we can't find you spiritually. We don't know where you are. And then you come and point your finger in the church and say, nobody cares. That's not true. You changed your phone number you didn't tell us. You don't call us. We must call you. We want to call you. But we don't have your number. You didn't update us. Please. Come out of the manger. Which is a necessary thing. Don't be a babe anymore. Quit. Being childish. Are you with me? Move into the house. Where Jesus is. Be wise. And give him a gift that will meet the immediate needs of the church. From the manger to the house. Our first leg in this journey, the pathway to power. God bless you. Pastor is going to come to wrap up. Hallelujah. I thank God for you. I hope you're beginning to understand the journey. If you're in any one of those places, I'll show you why you have to move out of the house next week. God bless you.